Welcome back for the second part of this, today's, this morning's panel. I'm going to quickly introduce Nick Nanos. Nick is currently a public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center. Um, Canadians may certainly know Nick from his polls. He was the official uh, pollster for the Globe and Mail for the last federal election. Um, he's got an appointment at the uh, University at Buffalo um, and working here on public opinion and energy issues. Um, it's great to have him here and to keep things moving, I'll turn it right over to you, Nick. Uh, thank you very much, David. So uh, I'm going to be the wagon master for panel two. Uh, we actually have a very distinguished panel. I'm expecting a peppy yet <laughs> insightful conversation. Right, Roger? Absolutely. Yeah? I promise. Good. Uh, so what I will do is I will uh, introduce our two panelists, and then uh, we'll start the dialogue uh, related to uh, infrastructure issues. So on my left is uh, John Canese. He's the director of North America for Heart Energy Consulting with current responsibilities manage the company's downstream services and government affairs and policy <laughs> issues for the region. Uh, prior to Hart, uh, he served as the Vice President of Regulatory and Technical Affairs for the Oxygenated Fuels Association in Washington. He's a former Executive Director of the Clean Transportation Advisory Council, where he developed strategic partnerships and outreach to address regulatory proposals and analyze risk potential involving <coughs> litigation on fuel issues. And then to uh, my right is Roger Martella, a partner in the Environmental Practice Group at Sidley Austin LLP. He recently joined the firm after serving as a general counsel of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, concluding 10 years of litigating and handling complex environmental and natural resource matters at the Department of Justice and EPA. He was unanimously confirmed. Doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> um, and that in his role at, as the EPA's chief legal advisor, he su supervised an office of 350 attorneys and 10 regional offices. Also interestingly, he, uh, he's uh, been involved in China, recognizing deficiencies in the China environmental law framework and challenges for multinational organizations. He created the China Environmental Law Initiative in 2007 and served as a visiting professor at the Environmental Law Institute of Wuhan University and the State Environmental Protection Agency and at Tsinghua University. So. Uh, that being said, I'd now like to uh, ask Roger to start his talk. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you for the invitation to be here today, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, Nick had mentioned the China Environmental Law Initiative that I started at EPA, and I, I want to just acknowledge that the Wils Woodrow Wilson Institute was a key partner on that, continues to be a key partner for that. It's an honor to be back in this very room um, for several times here. and. Normally I'm talking about China issues, and so it's interesting to talk about something different. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm, I'm an environmental lawyer, as probably pretty evident from my introduction, and I know there's a, a wide variety of folks in the room here. There's mostly policy people, I think, maybe some lawyers, people focused on energy, people focused on the environment, Canadians, Americans, and so I'm going to try to tailor this to a wide variety of interests. But I want to start with the fact that I'm an environmental lawyer because what I want to talk about is something that has dramatically changed my career and my profession in the last four years, and that has been the merger of environmental law issues and energy law issues. And the reason I want to talk about that is because even if you're not a lawyer, <coughs> and even if you're not an environmental lawyer, this is something that I think is going to profoundly affect and is profoundly affecting um, energy development, infrastructure development in ways that it didn't several years ago. A couple years ago, you were either an energy lawyer or an environmental lawyer. They had two different bar associations, two different conferences, and you did one or the other. Now it is virtually impossible to address an energy project without focusing on environmental law issues and vice versa. And to some extent, the environmental law issues are now trumping the traditional <coughs> energy law issues. And we're going to be talking about that. The Keystone Pipeline is probably the poster child of the, the melding of energy and the environment. But I can assure you, um, as someone who works on many, many energy projects, including some you've heard of and probably many you've never heard of, the environmental issues are always at the forefront of the thinking and the planning and the um, kind of the, the break it or not ability for projects to move forward. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I think I can move the slides myself, it looks like. I'm going to focus just on three trends. We're going to spend most of our time on the first one and then um, talk a little bit about the second and third. And it's going to be talking about this transition, this mer merging this intersection of energy law and environmental law and how environmental law is impacting energy projects. 
I'm going to talk about it at the federal level, the state level, and then kind of the citizen action level, or what we might call the NGO level, but how citizen groups are also taking action to use environmental law in a way that is kind of changing the landscape for energy. And we're going to start with um, the federal side, and again, spend most of our time there. And I'm going to focus primarily on what has been happening and what I think the Obama administration is going to be doing. And it's not that I'm trying to single out the Obama administration, but the reality is they've um, been in this area for four years, and they're going to be in this area for four years. So they are what is relevant today. And so we're going to focus on what exactly the Obama team and the Obama EPA, the Obama DOE are doing regarding this intersection of en energy law and environmental law. And I want to share with you, first of all, this, this pie chart. I know you're going to see lots of charts today. You've probably seen some already. This is, I think, the only chart I'm going to show you. And what this shows is the composition of greenhouse gases in the United States back in 2006. And you might think, well, that was a long time ago. But this chart is very relevant because this was the most current data that when the leaders of the Obama EPA came into office in 2009 had in front of them. They were looking at this very same chart. It is an EPA chart. And what this shows is something that's probably not too surprising, that the greenhouse gas composition of the United States is comprised of three primary sectors, utilities, transportation, and manufacturing, with utilities being slightly above a third, manufacturing being somewhat below a third, and transportation kind of roughly one third of the scope of greenhouse gas emissions. I think this is very important um, to understand because when we're talking about energy infrastructure and energy projects between Canada and the United States, all three of these sectors are implicated. Obviously, when it comes to transportation, <coughs> um, we can talk about cars and how, how much greenhouse gases are emitted by cars, but one of the primary factors going into that is fuels. And we know very well, everyone here knows better than I do, that a major energy issue between the United States and Canada is the ability to, to share fuels across the border, whether it's from the oil sands or from the new resources being developed in the United States. And so the regulations of greenhouse gases from fuels has large impact on the regulation of cross-border energy and energy infrastructure. Of course, there's u utilities, too. And um, increasingly, as the United States shifts its environmental policies on utilities, as we're going to talk about, it changes the energy makeup in the United States, perhaps less demand for coal, more demand for natural gas or renewables. And these trends are happening in Canada as well. And so as we see, um, different resources have different preferencing because of environmental laws for the first time we're going to see different supply and demand concerns between the U.S. and Canada. And then finally, manufacturing. Uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, manufacturing is a large consumer of electricity, a large consumer of energy. And both countries have vibrant manufacturing sectors, especially across the border, um, which are uh, undercoming some pressure because of both environmental regulation, the price of energy, and international trade issues with the developing world. And so these are all, all areas that are profoundly impacted across the border of all three sectors. And I want to give you a, a really concrete example of what I'm talking about. And I just want to pause for a minute to give you this one specific example, because when I say this has been a fundamental shift in the United States in terms of the role that environmental law is playing on energy law, I want to walk you through exactly how quickly this has happened and kind of the import of it. I'm going to begin, and I'm sorry this is so blurry, I, I promise I'll read it to you. I'm going to begin in 2009, in, in, I'm sorry, 2008, December of 2008, a month after President Obama was elected. And a month after he was elected, the Sierra Club published an article, and this is the article they published. It was responding to a, a decision that EPA had just issued, and it was a prediction for what they wanted the Obama administration to do back in December of 2008. And what they said is, we want the Obama administration to take the lead in phasing out coal-fired power plants in the United States so that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, would have a lead role in making sure no, coal, no new coal-fired power plants were built and that we would have um, existing coal-fired power plants phased out. And what they specifically proposed was EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, could set an emission standard of 800 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. This is really important. That would basically phase out any new coal-fired power plant. Just remember this number for a minute because we're going to come back to it. And then they said, and after they do that, they can, then they can eventually phase out natural gas facilities, too, and use renewables and things like that. And I have to say, I picked up on this in December of 2008, right when it came out. I do get their newsletters. And I would share this with clients. And I was either kind of laughed or put shoved out of the room. The notion in December of 2008 that the Environmental Protection Agency would be taking action to phase out coal-fired power plants in the U.S. seemed untenable. It seemed people 
challenged my credibility for the fact that I would even talk about this article and share this with them because it seemed beyond belief. But nonetheless, I thought that this was something, this, I could see that this trend was happening of environmental law influencing energy law and the notion that we could see the EPA playing a role in kind of the use of energy and the, the type of energy people use. So a couple months after that in February, uh, as Congress was debating cap and trade, we saw this proposal implemented into the, what was passed by the House of Representatives. So in the cap and trade legislation, I ask you to remember the 800 number, we saw this very same thing, a direction in section 116 to direct EPA to set the performance standard at first 1,100 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour and then 800 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. And I'm sorry for the numbers, but basically the short story is if those standards are set, no coal fire power plant can meet them without 90% carbon sequestration. So they basically translate those as saying you can build no new coal facility. So a couple months later, the House of Representatives had passed the very proposal to phase out coal and directing EPA to do that. But as you probably know, it didn't end up getting voted on by the full Congress and it didn't go anywhere until about a year after that in December, about a little more than a year, a year and a half in December, um, Sierra Club and some of the environmental groups came back to EPA and agreed with EPA to set a schedule by which EPA would engage in the very rulemaking that was proposed originally in December of 2008 and set a pretty aggressive schedule for doing so. And then finally in March of last year, so, so literally a year ago today or a year ago about right now, EPA did set the final proposal. They didn't say 800 pounds of CO2 per megawatt, they said 1,000 pounds, but it's basically the same thing. So what we've seen in that four year time is now because of the Environmental Protection Agency, not because of DOE or an energy agency, no new coal fire power plant can be built in the United States as we sit here today. And I think this is the example of what I'm talking about is in order for us to understand what is impacting energy projects in the US, we have to really understand what is how environmental law is influencing that because I don't think most people would have predicted four years ago an environmental agency, an environmental regulation would be the regulation that kind of shuts out new coal fire power plants. And <coughs> sorry, I thought I had more. Oh, and what we have here is an example beyond just the new source performance standard. This is this is the one I've been talking about, but we have a suite of regulations all within the last four years, and all of which will continue into the indefinite future, subject to court action, all of which are intended from an environmental law area, from the Environmental Protection Agency, to regulate energy. Not so much the emission of pollutants coming out of a smokestack, but the type of energy and the use of energy going in. So this is a fundamental transformation in the United States. And I know these, I'm going through these slides very fast, and they are going to be available, I think, after this on the internet, so for those of you who are trying to take notes. But what I've done for your reference later on is I've kind of outlined from the last four years what are all the regulations, the major regulations that are impacting each of these three sectors significantly. I think for purposes of this group, the, the most important ones are the fuel regulations, the renewable fuel standard, which plays some role in whether um, petroleum from the oil sands can be utilized in the United States, and some of the utility regulations, which are fundamentally changing the mix of energy in the United States, as we talked about with coal being phased out. This slide is kind of the, the inverse of that. This is what's going to happen in the next four years. I think, again, the pressure on renewable fuels and, and low carbon fuels is going to be a driving force for environmental regulation and continue to have that role in energy. I think that the, the phase out of coal will continue. Right now, that rule I talked about only applies to new coal-fired facilities. So those are shut down, and, and some of you may argue, well, they would be shut down anyway because natural gas is so cheap, no one's going to build coal today. That wasn't true four years ago. It wasn't even true 18 months ago. Um, and I think some people would debate whether that's even true today. But because of this regulation, new coal-fired power plants cannot be built today. That's a given. And what we're going to see happen in the next four years is these rules will start to apply to existing coal-fired power plants, as predicted in that article, and start to phase out some of the older existing plants and then over time even more than that. And then I think what we're going to see, as also foreshadowed by that article, attention turned to gas. Uh, right now, gas kind of gets in at that 1,000 pounds CO2 per megawatt hour, but that could change over time. And I also think we'll see more environmental regulation of hydraulic fracturing, which will also impact, of course, energy in the United States. So that's the, the summary on the federal issues. I'm going to spend just a, a minute or two each on the state and the NGO issues and then turn it over to my colleagues here. One of the other developments in the last four years, and this is more, I would say, in its infancy than at the federal level, but I think in the next four years we're going to see this be kind of a, a, a growth area in environmental law, which is the role of states doing the same thing, the states pack passing 
environmental regulations that have a fundamental impact on energy. And particularly, a lot of these, these regulations, these state-driven regulations, are targeted specifically at Canada at the oil sands. We'll never say that. There's no, nothing called the anti-Canada energy regulation. But if you dig behind these, and so the courts are doing that, you'll see that when we look into the history, a lot of it is directed specifically at the oil sands and other things that are happening in Canada that some of the states don't want coming into their states. And so the, the most kind of obvious example of that is the California and now the proposed Oregon low carbon fuel standards, which say that a certain percentage of petroleum sold in the states, or each, I'm sorry, the, the carbon content of petroleum sold in the states cannot exceed a certain amount, and you wouldn't be surprised that that amount necessarily forecloses oil sands oil from being used in California and would be in Oregon if finalized. That case is being litigated in the Ninth Circuit right now on the grounds that it violates the Constitution by allowing California to regulate outside the borders of California, which, which violates what we call the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The District Court had agreed with that position, and right now the Ninth Circuit's considering it. Beyond that, um, <coughs> California has taken the initiative, but other states are joining, kind of cap-and-trade programs. While we don't have a national cap-and-trade program in the United States, California has created its own. It's, it's very rigorous and thorough and is looking to expand it by joining or what they call linking both with other states, other countries, and even provinces. Ontario, for example, Quebec, I'm sorry, is proposed to link its program with California. So what we may have in California is the very first international cap-and-trade program between a U.S. jurisdiction and a foreign jurisdiction arising out of the state. And the way both the, the California program and the Quebec program are designed is they specifically talk about the carbon content of energy coming into the state or the province, and they discriminate against high carbon energy that is coming across the border into the state. So these, again, state regulations are having profound impacts on kind of cross-border trade of energy and the impact of energy, and to some extent specifically target at, at higher carbon energy from outside the state's border. And then finally, a, a life cycle analysis. I think folks know life cycle analysis is when you look at not just the greenhouse gases emitted at the time of combustion, but going all the way back to the generation of the fuel, the transportation of the fuel, and so on. And, and a lot of the, the Canadian energy resources, obviously, under a traditional life cycle analysis, fare not so well compared to some other things because of transportation, because of some of the energy involved in extracting them. And so a life cycle analysis, which are being more widely adopted by the states, are a way of, I think, regulating this cross-border energy issues without actually saying that. And then finally, I think the most, um, the, this is kind of the, the growth area here, the, the most important trend and one that could have the biggest impact long term at the end of the day has been the role that citizen groups or NGOs have been playing in the energy field. Um, the Keystone Pipeline has brought to the attention kind of how uh, citizen groups, and it, it's, I think it's something in America that that is part of our system and, and something that everyone agrees is part of our democratic process, but how citizen groups can uh, get involved in projects and um, oppose them, whether it's in court or through a regulatory process or through a petition process. And some of the, the words that people have gotten familiar with or acronyms have been NEPA and ESA. Uh, this is the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. These were laws passed in the 1970s for very specific purposes, but over many decades have been expanded to become very uh, significant tools in the toolbox of groups who want to oppose all kinds of projects, whether it's a, a Walmart in your backyard or a major pipeline project crossing the border. And, and I'm sure you've heard about this very much, but those are kind of the go-to tools that have been used traditionally and have been quite effective for groups in court on these major projects. Um, beyond NEPA and the ESA, there's typically other grounds to challenge projects, including just challenging a permit, saying that whoever issued the permit, whether it was EPA, DOE, DOI, the Department of Interior, just got it wrong, didn't apply the facts to the law. And even if it's not always a meritorious claim, the cost and the delay associated with those challenges can go on for years and sometimes discourage a group from pursuing an energy project. We saw that a few weeks ago. There was a project in Corpus Christi, Texas called Las Brisas, and after many years of delay and litigation, they announced publicly they would no longer pursue the project because they could not any longer accept the uncertainty of um, the NGO challenges that had been, been brought. Beyond challenging specific um, projects, environmental groups have also become very effective at regulatory challenges, kind of influencing the regulatory agenda of the government. And that's yeah, everybody 
wants to have some influence, both environmental groups and industry groups, and so that's not a criticism. But nonetheless, there has been a, um, a strong ability of groups to have some influence over how regulations should proceed. There's a, a saying right now you hear a lot in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you hear of it outside the Beltway called sue and settle. It's become one of these buzzwords where the notion that environmental groups will pick an issue, <coughs> sue the agency on it, and then reach a settlement with them where the agency will agree to a deadline to enact regulations. That's exactly what happened in that new source performance standard we walked through significantly. And right now there's a lot of buzz on Capitol Hill about regulatory reform and legislative reform addressing sue and settle and what, the, what Congress and the court should be doing about it. In the last several weeks and months, um, numerous groups have filed many petitions with EPA saying you need to be doing more to address climate change. Even though you're doing some things, you're not doing enough and we want to see you do more. And so they're using these petitions to advance uh, climate change agendas. And another example very much impacting oil and, and energy is environmental groups arguing that oil and gas fields or hydraulic fracturing fields that are many miles away and may be insignificant by themselves should be aggregated together, even if they're not conti contiguous to each other, and getting the agencies to take a look at them as a whole and then treating them as a major source, like a big, large factory or, or power plant. And the environmental groups have been at the, f not so much the EPA has kind of stayed on the sidelines, but the environmental groups have been pushing this issue as an agenda item. They've had some mixed results in the court. So it's another example where the government's not regulating something so directly other groups are stepping in. And then, of course, if that doesn't fail, there's always litigation. Um, there's been a number of recent kind of very high-profile cases that environmental groups have brought to kind of, again, advance an agenda of climate change, uh, energy, and the intersection of environment and energy. There's uh, a well-known case from the Supreme Court called AEP, where environmental groups were suing several utilities to say that they should be held accountable for their greenhouse gas emissions based on the common law theory of nuisance, going back to um, you know, hundreds of years, and the Supreme Court rejected it in that specific case, but there's other cases out there that are kind of coming back and trying some alternative theories. There was a case last year in federal court, and in 50 states, um, groups brought petitions and lawsuits in both federal court and all 50 states asking the governments of each of these states and the federal government to address climate change through something called the public trust doctrine for the benefit of children and again to use new tools in the toolbox to take actions beyond what they currently have authority to do to take more aggressive actions towards climate change. And again, talking about cross-border issues, um, there's also been challenges under Section 526 of the Energy Independence and Security Act uh, by environmental groups trying to prevent the federal government from purchasing oil sands oil and um, using Canadian uh, oil sands crude as part of the Defense Department's budget and so they uh, supply. And so they, they didn't proceed in that action because they lacked standing. But another example of how it's not just the federal government states who are playing this arena, but also citizen groups who are very much um, addressing the agenda. And Nick, with that, I will turn it back <coughs> to you. Sweet. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. I'd now like to ask John to uh, do his talk. Okay. Thank you very much, Roger, Nick. Um, I want to thank the uh, Wilson Center and the Canada Institute for giving me the opportunity oh, thank you, to uh, participate on this panel discussion. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, one of the few times, I'm a policy person like Roger, it's going to be one of the few times that you'll see a presentation by a policy person that doesn't have real bullet points. It's all data slides. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, I also want to thank, uh, this is on a theme from Andy. Um, Canada, and particularly Montreal, for sending the expos to us. Um, we have an exciting year coming up with our Washington Nationals. I'm a longtime baseball fan and, and coach, youth coach, so uh, I can't wait for the season. <coughs> okay, let me... Whoa. Obligatory slide about the company, real quick. Um, been around for a long time. It's about one-third publishing, does... Uh, magazines like Oil and Gas Investor and Exploration Production and Fuel Magazine and a number of uh, upstream, downstream newsletters, weeklies, dailies, etc. One third is conferences. Uh, we just concluded a very successful uh, development on conventional gas and oil uh, conference in Calgary. Um, and you know, it, it, it's a very exciting um, division in the company. And then about one third of it is really research and consulting with a whole slate of uh, clients from oil and gas producers, auto manufacturers, governments, um, et cetera. So enough about that. All right, <coughs> data. Uh, 
okay, so I can see. Uh, left side is pro our projected tight oil production expansion. And you can see over a decade, 2010, to our forecast 2020, it's almost a 700% growth that's going to occur, up to uh, over 3.5 million barrels a day. Uh, it demonstrates just how much production is expected to expand. It's a mix of crudes, uh, the Bakken, Permian, Eagle Ford. All these are uh, different plays. Uh, Canada is uh, on the right-hand side of their crude production. It's going to become a major, major crude oil producer. Um, U.S. Uh, combined with uh, U.S. output, um, we're probably going to be make producing more crude oil than any other region in the in the world. This is not capacity. You know, Saudi Arabia will maintain that, but they will become a swing capacity or a producer. Um, this expanded production is going to need to be incorporated into the marketplace. And I think the key takeaway here is it's going to be developed and it's going to be absorbed into the market. Um, recent estimates on Canadian tight oil plays are going to add an additional 150,000 barrels a day by 2020. And then on top of that, another increment in five years of about 180,000. So <clears throat> most of this is being delivered into the mid-continent. There are options with Canada is looking at how they're going to move their product, but uh, it's going to stress the infrastructure and the logistics for the movements. Okay, on this slide, like it says at the top, uh, a race to North American petroleum. It says independence. I'd like to say self-sufficiency rather than independence. Uh, but uh, it illustrates, again, the net North American production on the left and it represents the United States and Canada. It does not include Mexican product mining. Um, the right side is a progression of uh, liquid product output towards self-sufficiency, projected increase 40 percent uh, above the 2012 um, time point. Uh, total output about 15.8 million barrels per day by 2024. Uh, Canadian heavy and shale oils are going to be main sources of this expansion. <coughs> um, and, of course, looking at the self-sufficiency, our forecast is somewhere in that 2020-2022 range, um, a little different than some of the other forecasts out there. We're a little more um, uh, bullish, I think, on, on how much can be developed and how quickly it will be developed and brought into the marketplace. Um, for the period from 2012 to 2022, shale production is going to go up about 2.6 million barrels a day, Canadian production by 2.2 million. Uh, NGL, which is going to become an important uh, uh, issue to address on what we're going to do with uh, these, these gas liquids, are going to increase by about 800,000 barrels a day. And uh, again, that's an infrastructure and use challenge. Um, one of the things is that overall demand in, in the region is actually going down because of uh, uh, fuel efficiency requirements for the uh, vehicle fleet. Uh, cafe standards that are being implemented this decade and going into the next. Um, leaves about a net of 5.8 million barrels a day. Uh, in 2012, net imports into the United S into the region were about 5.7 million barrels a day. Okay. Uh, illustrated just a little differently <coughs> um, is the need, uh, I think, here to export crude oil to balance out the supply with the demands uh, that will exist. Uh, and this is really earlier than many of us uh, anticipated, even just a couple of years ago. Um, there will still be imports into the uh, region, particularly in the east and west coasts, um, because the refinery processors don't have the full access to the domestic and mid-continent Canadian crudes. That's <coughs> some of the infrastructure discussion that we're having here of how do we bring those products to where the refining centers are. Um, so I think uh, you know, the logistic and infrastructure issues about efficient movement, we talked about pipelines and, of course, the extensive rail movements of Canadian and particularly the Bakken crudes into the East Coast. There's a couple of big developments that are taking place there. <coughs> and the last data slide here, in a sense, uh, is uh, the mix of these products. A lot of what's coming out is uh, low sulfur, uh, light sweet products. Um, the refining industry in North America, particularly Gulf Coast, was uh, all configured and designed for uh, high sulfur uh, type crudes, heavier crudes, and uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to start incorporating 
uh, these lighter products that are coming out of the shell plays, the high quality crudes. Um, the current constraint that exists of exporting U.S. crude oil <coughs> uh, results in increase in U.S. Uh, as I said, U.S. crude that's, that is light and low sulfur, um, and it clearly can create a non-optimum um, economic situation for f refinery operations in the country. Uh, the Gulf Coast's uh, refineries in particular, we're also seeing some challenges on the East Coast with uh, closures that have occurred. Uh, most amazing that an airline company bought a refinery. Uh, that one uh, surprises me. So... Uh, from the logistics and infrastructure standpoint, uh, there's going to have to be improvement to take, take advantage of the opportunities of these crude products so that they get to the suitable markets and to the suitable refiners. Um, let's see here. So um, from a bottom line uh, standpoint, the mid-continent Canadian production can lead to what I'll call an oversupply into the North American markets. I think balancing the slate of products um, for uh, adjusting to the infrastructure and the logistics is going to mean more pipelines. It's going to mean more efficient rail service because we are going to have to move the product coming out along both of those approaches. Um, and the key issue is going to be down the road, 2020, 2022, 2022 uh, is how to get any of this surplus out into the export markets. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's various options out there. Alberta recently restructured some of their loyalty for uh, allowing incentives to help build out the infrastructure that's needed. And uh, maybe other states and provinces need to also look at, at how they will uh, ensure the infrastructure is there. And I do want to acknowledge Terry Higgins out of our office. He is our chemical engineer refining guru that does a lot of the modeling and, and really understands this far, far better than me. And uh, I will send you to him if you have detailed questions about these data. And I think that's it. Great. Uh, thank you, John and Roger, for uh, your talk. Um, I'm going to kind of start the ball rolling with a couple uh, questions. It's interesting, earlier Andy Black talked about the energy revolution. And I know when he used the word revolution, I thought sometimes revolutions are good, sometimes they're bad. Many times they lead to unintended places. The journey is not always pleasant. Now, thinking of that, the first question I have for, we'll start with Roger and then John I have, is what are the threats and opportunities to develop energy infrastructure in North America? Well, I think the threats from, you know, what I do as an environmental lawyer working in the energy law, law area, I think we, um, I went through those in, in some detail, but I think if I were to summarize all these different things that are happening at the federal, state, and NGO level, the biggest threat, I think, is uncertainty to the developers. It's, it's not even the process or the, or the co cost to some extent. I, I think any of my clients would recognize, as I said, that in our system, we, we all support the notion of environmental regulation. We all support the notion of the ability of citizen groups to challenge a project and go into court and do that. And no one, I think, would ever propose taking that away. But I think what happens is, our s despite good ideals, there are are breakdowns in our system and that there's no timeline to when things can get done. A court can have a case going for many years when the financing is, has a limited window. There's no correlation there. Or uh, it, an agency might sit on a permit for 18 months when there's a limited window to get the financing done or, or to actually get into the ground and build the project because it's a certain time of year. And so I think the, the biggest risk as a le legal perspective look, working on environmental laws is this concept of uncertainty and not knowing um, this is, we spent a lot of time on this. What are the odds that we're going to survive this case? What are the odds that the court are going to decide this by X state? What are the odds that we're going to get a permit out of the agency by this state? And frequently we can't really answer those questions other than throw darts at the dartboard. And that makes the people who are responsible for financing these projects or investing in these projects very, very nervous because, it's, as you know better than me, they don't like to live in that world of uncertainty. Thank you. Mark, uh, John? Yeah. Um, I think uh, one... Uh, uh, both threat and opportunity is economic. And that's uh, the competitiveness of low-priced natural gas that's opening up a lot of opportunities in power and petrochemicals. Um, I think that uh, the discounts of mid-continent supplies uh, that will advantage certain refining operations, um, 
course, it disadvantages some of the East Coast because they're benchmarked off of a global crude pricing Brent differential. Um, so I think the economic opportunity of developing these and making sure they get to the markets is, is just we need, to, we need to take advantage of it. The threat side, again, is economic. Uh, if you don't get it, the products into <laughs> the right markets, uh, they become stranded. Um, and it becomes more difficult to keep developing it because um, producers aren't going to invest in it to keep drilling and keep bringing the product out. Um, we talked about permitting issues, the land rights issues of getting pipelines, particularly to move the product very efficiently. Everything gets litigated nowadays. So um, the cost for these projects, the time frames for these projects just continues to expand. And then, uh, in a sense, the competitiveness on a rail side is the competition that's going to exist between tanker cars for crude product, for petrochemicals, for ethanol, 900,000 barrels a day of that product being used. So uh, there, there, there are challenges there, but um, the industry is pretty remarkable. I've been involved in it for 28, 29 years, 28 years, and it's pretty remarkable how they solve, uh, solve these issues. Yeah, as a, as a follow-up, um, you know, obviously infrastructure doesn't pop out of a box when we look at the infrastructure for pipelines that's been developed over the last 50 years. But obviously, you know, you look at some of your stunning charts, there are some kind of uh, very short-term kind of capacity issues we heard about in the first panel. Uh, what do you see as kind of the short and medium-term look on in terms of the energy market and investment um, and developing energy policy? Good question. Um, right now, there is certainly a lot of investment that's taking place. Um, everything I have, I started yesterday putting a list of some of the market updates. Uh, things like Kendra Morgan's Energy Partner um, uh, with their 220,000 crude to rail project that's taking place. Uh, Ambridge, the Northern Gateway pipeline work, Trans Canada's efforts. So um, I think in the short term, uh, right now, there's investments being made so that we can uh, build out this infrastructure. Uh, if it, I guess the threat is in a short, short to medium term, can it all get done fast enough? Yeah. And I have to say that's, uh, that's a $64,000 question. Um, hard to say whether, whether all those approvals will go through. Um, good friend Carmen, we were talking about the Keystone uh, and the approval process and what are the odds uh, of that actually getting approved? Um, personally, everything that I know long-term in the business is, uh, it, it certainly is in the national interest, in the North American interest to uh, complete that pipeline and approve it. Uh, and for you, Roger, on the environmental front in terms of the short and medium term, so let's say if we look at an infrastructure project such as Keystone, uh, from <coughs> the environmental stakeholder perspective, gaming out those options in the short term, what can we expect? I, I think um, this is a good question about short term versus long term because I think some of this, what happens in the short term is going to influence what happens in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at perhaps the three energy issues that we've been talking about, coal, gas, and, um, and pipeline projects and infrastructure projects on coal, the short term does not look good from an environmental perspective. As we talked about, you can't build a new facility and you are going to have a hard time maintaining your old facility if the rules continue to get more stringent. You can maybe export coal today, but even that is becoming under greater scrutiny. On, on gas right now, in the United States at least, um, it's largely state dependent. Some states are very encouraging of gas and some states are not. My prediction is those that are not are going to join those that are encouraging of it. It's going to be harder for states to block gas when if you're in Pennsylvania, if you're in New York and you're looking across the border and seeing the Pennsylvania economy do quite well in attracting manufacturing, but just because you're in New York, none of that's happening. So I think long term, that's going to be a better outlook um, environmentally. I think in terms of pipelines and infrastructure projects, I think, you know, if my expertise were looking at this and saying, I think like everyone else is from their perspective, this one is really hard to call in terms of what's going to happen in the short term. It seems like this is a poster child for kind of every issue that could come up. But I do think longer term, people will look at Keystone or other major projects like that and say, we, we can't do this ad hoc anymore. We can't just kind of keep this uncertainty going 
this long for something that's that important. And so I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned, whether it's approved or disapproved, won in court, fought in court, and looking at reform. I think maybe that is the issue that finally spurs some reform to say we now need to bring greater certainty, talking about the things that John talked about, all this potential here, um, and we can't necessarily let the uncertainty of these processes stand in the way. And so longer term, I'm more optimistic that we'll see some kind of compromise in terms of how these projects will be dealt with in a uniform way across the board. Good. So we have some optimism on my right. John, are you optimistic or pessimistic in uh, terms of energy infrastructure? And I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, it's providing such a great opportunity. Ohio is retooling uh, uh, specialty mills for producing pipe because they could do it at a competitive cost to international producers. Uh, natural gas is the reason, $3.5 per million BTU. Um, you know where those pipes are going? To the Bakken for part of the drilling. So uh, it's it's really, uh, yes, I'm, I'm very, very bullish that we're going to build this out. Uh, we've got regulatory structures. There's the Pipeline Safety Regularity, Certainty, and Job Creation Act that uh, will help, you know, ensure pipeline, uh, again, safety, that best practices are used in the operations. We saw a chart some figures, 99.9999% of products being delivered safely. So that's a remarkable achievement, both, again, rail and pipeline. So uh, yes, there will be a lot of noise around the fringes, but um, I think as consumers recognize the, uh, the uh, uh, benefits that they're getting and accruing because of low energy costs, uh, they want that. We, we've expect that in this country. We don't pay the same prices they do in Europe for petrol. Mm -hmm. um, our prices are high, but I've been over there enough and I know the prices. So yes, we're going to get there. Okay. So I'm going to open the floor up to questions. And uh, as uh, David Biet mentioned before, please uh, say your name and uh, ask your question. So with lots of hands. So we're going to uh, start uh, with the Globe and Mail. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Paul Coring. I'm with the Globe and Mail. Um, I have a question for Mr. Martella. A everybody seems to be sort of looking at this Keystone decision as though it's the end of a long, and its proponents would argue, a too long story. But if somebody came to you and said, uh, in the event of a green light on Keystone, I'd like to tie this up for a decade. Um, would that be easy to do? Yeah, I'd like to say that this is being streamed live over the internet. <laughs> just, just, <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> just as a so, so to understand the question, it, would it be po would it legally could you find ways to? Yeah, um, I don't want to. I'm going to take that out of the context of Keystone specific. But let's talk about a hypothetical sure. a hypothetical um, <laughs> pipeline yeah. environment uh, large uh, infrastructure th project th th crosses a bunch of jurisdictions. Could you tie it up for ten years? Um, I will put it this way. Much smaller projects than that have been tied up for longer periods of time. Uh, and uh, so it's hard to say for sure because it depends on the court. It depends on the states involved. But, but it is not beyond belief that an organized strategic group could find multiple levers in a complex project like that to cause – even going to court once and winning on one NEPA issue will send it back to an agency and add years of delay. And so there are ways to stretch things out. And, and if I could just follow up, would that, I mean, is that an incredibly costly thing to do? Are we talking, you know, six-figure events rather than seven-figure events? It, it, is, um, <laughs> it, it is definitely costly in terms of the amount of money that's spent kind of, you know, both paying my fees and all the other consultants and things and the supplies of the pipes that are sitting there that aren't being built. But I, I think where the real risk comes from, again, is not so much in that dollar amount because these are big projects and people know there's that risk. It is really the uncertainty. Um, does the market dynamics change during this delay? And I think that's part of the strategy from the environmental groups. The longer they can stretch this out, it may be that the market dynamics change. Um, the, the project is no longer justifiable. The Wall Street has changed, so the, the financing is no longer there. And so it, it makes sense, I think, from that strategy to sometimes delay itself can be victory. Okay. I believe there was a question behind Paul. Yes. 
Good morning. My name is Sarah Smith. I'm a reporter with SNL Energy. I was just wondering, there seems to be kind of a significant amount on the energy and uh, environmental regulatory fronts of, kind of tug of war between states and federal regulations. And it seems to be different in a variety of aspects of infrastructure from pipelines and then even from the exploration and production aspect of things. Where do you see that going? Do you see that getting resolved? And is there any one facet of that, like pipelines versus fracking or something, um, where that's working out better than it is in another area? In, in it's, coming. It's, it's an interesting question because I, I think the um, our system in the United States is built on a system of what we call federalism, which is that the state should really take the lead on these types of issues, but the federal government sets something of a baseline. <laughs> but as we saw in the examples with California, California is doing things that even the federal government's not doing, including negotiating international agreements on climate change and cap and trade that the federal government's not engaged in. So I, I think that there's going to be what I call pushing the envelope approaches, states that are unsatisfied with the federal government not being stringent enough and wanting to set an example on their own. And what's unfortunate about that at the end of the day is we get back to uncertainty. It creates a checkerboard of regulations in the United States, and that's what the whole system of federalism is designed to avoid, the notion that you can pretty much be consistent in the U.S. in terms of having similar opportunities. And so we look at the Pennsylvania New York example in Pennsylvania. If you're on one side of the border, you can engage in hydraulic fracturing. If you're in New York, you can't. And it's driving very significantly different economic opportunities. I think it's not going to be so much legal pressure, but political pressure that causes some uniformity there. Um, I don't think a court can intervene necessarily and say New York has to do what Pennsylvania is doing, but it may be those people who are living on both sides of the border who see the disparate treatment there that put the political pressure on. I think we're actually seeing a bit of that, just the beginning, leading edge of that in New York right now. John? Yeah, I, I, I want to reinforce what Roger said about uh, the politics on these issues um, that become very localized. Um, you know, states, Iowa, <coughs> um, um, the governor's recently signed some legislation that increases civil penalties on pipeline incidences. So, uh, you know, they certainly have the ability to um, enact their own uh, level of standards, more stringent. You know, th we're seeing that with hydraulic fracturing as opposed to federal. We also have uh, the, the interesting um, development in, in the oil and gas industry that um, production is going down quite considerably on federal controlled lands, whereas they're rising dramatically on, on what I'll call non-federal or public, uh, uh, privately held you know, land. Um, just a couple of numbers, you know, the natural gas is uh, on federal lands, that includes offshore, onshore, is about 33% down, uh, I think it's over the last five years. Whereas on the non-federal lands, it's up uh, over 40%. Um, for the oil side, 7% down, but it's up, uh, the output is up over, over a million barrels. On, on, um, so that will certainly, I think, uh, um, influence how, how uh, the decisions are being made at different localities. Thank you. We're going to move this way. Yes, right here. <coughs> Yes, you. Sorry. Yes, for you. Here you go. Why don't you talk loud? <laughs> <laughs> There's a microphone magically appearing. Uh, Mike Sponder, no affiliation. This would be to Roger. Your thousand uh, number. Mm -hmm. uh, and without editorializing, the uh, alternatives couldn't have created enough energy by 2020. What would have happened, in your opinion, uh, would there have been a backlash without the natural gas explosion? Because if you can't build or even improve coal-fired plants, and what would happen without natural gas? You know, that's such a fascinating question because <coughs> I think from some perspective, there was a happy coincidence that at the same time certain groups are pursuing the such phase out coal, look at what happens, natural gas kind of addresses the problem to some extent on these new facilities. <laughs> and I think what would have happened without the natural gas explosion, we would still have the very same regulation. I don't think the regulation would have changed, um, but it's, it's very helpful for Sierra Club and EPA to point to this and say, look, it doesn't matter anyway because natural gas has taken care of this. In terms of what would have happened on energy supply, I think we 
you know, working closely with these folks, I don't think they're crying wolf. I think we would have seen, and we may still see, um, you know, significant reliability issues, vulnerabilities to the grid. We've already seen that in Texas over the past few summers and some other parts of the country. I think by phasing out the ability to bring this new energy online, absent natural gas, that would have um, definitely gotten to be more severe of a problem. And I think it's still, from what I can tell, still is a problem. I don't think natural gas is fully compensated for coal or, or just stepped in and taken over that role. Th there's also one more thing on this, like the, the facility I mentioned, Las Brisas, was a pet coke facility. This is a residue of the refining industry that we're shipping to other parts of the world anyway. And so we had this resource available and using very clean technology that could have taken advantage of it as opposed to s shipping it in boats and sending it to China where they're much less efficient than we are. And so we're, we're basically phasing out opportunities like that. It's not always black and white coal versus natural gas. We're, we're shutting out those options too. Okay, uh, we'll go Robert and the gentleman in front of you and then we'll shift over here. Robert Johnson. Thank you, yeah, Robert Johnson from Eurasia Group. I wanted to return to that difficult first question that was asked, but I'll ask it in a different way. Um, one of the things with Keystone, all these pipelines, as well as LNG exports, is the question of how do the courts treat national interest determination, public interest, that's a phrase we hear a lot. I, I think with the previous decision on Clipper, it, there was, I forget which environmental group sued on that one, but I think there was a sense that from the courts that that, that, that phrase has a lot of discretion for the executive branch to determine is that right, or how, can you comment a little bit on how this is going to play out? I, I think, you know, as a lawyer, I'd like to say that you can look at any court in, in the land and say they're going to look at it the same way, and we can give you advice. But a lot of the advice we give involves looking at the specific court, the specific judges, and trying to look at patterns of how the courts look at it. It's not a surprise that the Ninth Circuit in California tends to read things more in favor of the being sympathetic to the environmental protection. Um, the courts in Texas, perhaps, you know, as an example of courts that are perhaps more sympathetic to um, seeing the economic impacts of environmental regulations. And so it's, it's not always easy to answer those questions out, of, you know, without looking at that context. Um, but I, I do think, in general, we find pretty consistent decisions when it's a true violation of the law. There's very few courts either way, whether you're sympathetic to one side or the other, that would tolerate a violation of the law. And what happened in the AEP case I talked about, the public nuisance case, that was a case where the three judges sitting in New York um, decided that environmental groups could be held, I'm sorry, utilities could be held accountable for their carbon emissions going all the way back historically. And that really surprised people. The notion, you know, the AEP was looking at sitting through a trial where their carbon emissions were going to be put on trial and then what are going to be the economic consequences of that. It took the Supreme Court to reverse that and unanimously reversed it. So that's just an example that shows kind of these analysis are always dependent on the specific court and the judges and ultimately you hope at the end of the day that you have someone sitting there that's gonna <coughs> kind of look at this objectively regardless of your perspective. Okay, and uh, Mike Brennan from the State Department. I wanted to uh, talk about the competitiveness issue in the midstream sector, the pipeline storage. Are you seeing any trends or rapid trends in consolidation and would you see that coming? Uh, when we f when find out that infrastructure projects are taking a longer time to to completion if they even get started, and just speak to that competitiveness issue. Um, yeah, in a word, yes. Some some uh, consolidations are occurring um, in midstream. I think uh, the expense, the investments needed uh, to do this, uh, are forcing some of that. Um, I'm I'm not as expert on on the midstream side. We do have some folks in our office that any any worries that you you get a, a behemoth, a Kinder Morgan's, those kind of companies that you know uh, have a significant portion of pipelines and storage issues. And it's not just pipelines; it's rail uh, folks too that uh, have the ability to uh, um, put on long-term leases for the <coughs> for the cars um, that have relationships with builders for the cars. Um, the pipeline side, it, it, it's expensive because of litigation, because of permitting needs, um, and, and they're the ones that can do it. There, I think there will always be mid-sized companies, regional, but uh, yeah, we're seeing a lot more consolidations. Okay, and then we'll go over here. This gentleman here from Mr. Dukert. Uh, Joe Dukert, Independent Energy Analyst. My question is for Roger. 
uh, one of these days the White House is going to send to Congress uh, the Clinton-Espinosa Agreement, uh, which, will, uh, which will open the possibility for joint development along the uh, U.S.-Mexican uh, border in the Gulf. Uh, that prompts my question about uh, the federalism issue that you raised. Uh, is there precedent or, or can you foresee um, uh, a situation uh, in, in which uh, the difference in, in rules about fracking uh, for a field that would be unitized across state lines might arise? I, I think um, there's two ways to look at that. I do think there's a possibility that the federal government will want to set national standards. There's a question about whether they have the legal authority to do so, but it's hard for the federal government to see what is the biggest energy environmental issue in the U.S. right now kind of go unregulated at the national level. And I would predict that they're going to get creative as they can to kind no, of no put the footprint. Stuff. There's no precedent. There's a little bit of precedent right now we can talk about, but nothing nothing that's directly saying we're setting natural, national standards for hydraulic fracturing across the country. Um, I do think that we're going to see that in the next four years and attempt to do so. At the same time, I don't think anything can really take away the state's ability to maintain some flexibility there and even be, even if the government were to do that and could legally do that, the states still have the option of being more stringent. That's part of our cooperative federalism system that even if the, the federal government said, here's the minimal standards for fracturing, New York could still say, well, we want to ban all fracturing or we want to do it in a more stringent way. And there's, because of that, there's always going to be this risk for this checkerboarding across the country. It really takes states coming together and working collaboratively to kind of decide how they're going to avoid that checkerboard effect. <coughs> yeah, I, I'd like to just add, too, uh, that uh, there's an ongoing now an EPA study that is looking at hydraulic fracturing um, uh, mandated by Congress, and it's to look at water impacts. This study um, has been substantially expanded in my mind. Um, it's looking at air, it's looking at a lot of other multimedia aspects to uh, hydraulic fracturing. And preliminary report will be out mid-year this year and then final some point next year, winter next year. And I think that that will have an influence on the regulatory development that we talked about. And I, regarding the uh, Mexico-U.S., I, I guess there's some question as to whether it's an agreement or is it a treaty that needs Senate ratification. They could send it to Congress and find out. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay, this gentleman here. Uh, Carmine DePilio again from the Department of Energy. Uh, without diminishing the, the, the very uh, important uh, EPA report coming out, I wanted to mention uh, two reports that I think are important from the standpoint of sustainable development of uh, natural gas and oil, actually, uh, through unconventional techniques. Uh, one of the first things that Secretary Chu did uh, after becoming Secretary of Energy is he established a, a, a group under his uh, Secretarial Energy Advisory Board. It was chaired by John Deutsch, and they put out a very important report on sustainable development of, of unconventional natural gas. And uh, I think the messages in that report, especially to industry, are, are still important and relevant. And a couple of years later, uh, Fatih Barrel uh, with the International Energy Agency put out a book called the Golden Rules of, for a Golden Age of Gas, and uh, uh, establishing many of the same recommendations to both government and industry about keeping this vital resource uh, uh, sustainable. So I just wanted to mention both those reports that I think, even though they're now a little dated, are still very important and <coughs> have messages for industry that good uh, performance by industry helps establish the regulatory environment by not creating a need for uh, excessive reg regulation. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I'll take one more question over here, <coughs> and then uh, we're on time. Well, I'm taking your question. Oh, okay. <coughs> Myron Ebel, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, Roger, you have a sort of a, a a theory of kind of prosperity leakage from Pennsylvania into New York. <laughs> uh, let me give you uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the political spin on that that I would put is that uh, New York is a very heavily democratic state 
upstate New York is marginally Republican. It's been going down economically since the closure of the Erie Canal. Uh, opening up shale gas in upstate New York will create uh, a, a – New York will essentially become a new petro state, and Chuck Schumer will start talking about defending the oil industry. <laughs> I think there are very strong interests in the Democratic Party that are going to be uh, – I think you see this with Cuomo going forward and then pulling back when, when they keep reminding him of this. And I, th I think at the end he's going to resist it, and I expect the next governor will as well. Yeah, and I, I'm not as close to the politics in New York, but um, I definitely understand the potential there from, from what I've, I've heard. And it, it, there is something of a mixed personality that we're seeing in terms of the hurry up and stop, hurry up and stop. And so I think we'll, we'll hopefully see that resolved before too long. Okay, I, I understand we can take one question. Yes? <coughs> and I need that quote. Paul That's Connors, something. Canadian Embassy. Thank you both for your presentation. Roger, you spent some time uh, showing the greenhouse gas profile of the United States and the various actions on the electricity sector and its implication for coal. Uh, uh, presuming this is an administration that wants to do more, what else does it do on the transportation sector, which is about a third of the, the emissions? It's done CAFE, is that it? Or what else will it do? Or do you foresee it possibly to, or John? Well, th well thank you. And you know, if, if, if I had time to go through my slides a little slower, you would have seen that I, my prediction for the next four years on transportation was mission accomplished, that, that that is where in the first six months of the last administration, they were very aggressive on the CAFE standards. They got more aggressive. Their goal at this point is to implement, make sure the CAFE standards come together. There's an opportunity to fudge them again. They don't want to see them ratcheted down. The renewable fuel standards under attack from every angle possible, and EPA is under attack on that, so they're going to have to put a lot of energy into preserving the renewable fuel standard. And I think what we're going to see potentially <laughs> is um, the attempt at a national low carbon fuel standard. That may be where they go. And I know for those who have interest in Canadian um, energy issues, the notion of a low carbon fuel standard sends a little chill up the spine. But I don't think it's going to stop at California. The court's going to decide that one way or another. And I think my prediction is EPA is waiting to see how the court resolves that. And then they'll be taking a step. Now, I have serious doubts about their legal authority to do a low carbon fuel standard, but again, I, I, I would foresee them taking a hard look and maybe wanting to try. Yeah, I think on the CAFE standards, the uh, fuel economy standards, it covers both the light duty and heavy duty. Um, and in a sense, they, they really ramp up as we go through this decade. And I don't have a demand curve on, on transport fuels, but you would see just how much gasoline demand in this country would, would drop. Um, diesel is, is still expanding some, but uh, the gasoline particularly. So, uh, and the National Low Carbon Fuel Standard, um, yeah, there were attempts, uh, at least legislatively with that, uh, that didn't go anywhere. And uh, agree that whether EPA has some authority to do that under, uh, uh, under the Clean Air Act title. Okay, great. Um, if we could uh, thank our panelists for today's discussion. And uh, now I'd like to uh, pass, uh, pass it back to David Biet. Um, the Premier is in the building. Um, and as politicians, you know, we know politicians, they like to talk to, talking with uh, Jane Harmon, the President Director. So um, these guys have to leave, sit tight, and we'll check outside to see where they are. But you should be here in just a minute. Uh, he is here.
I'd like to present Premier Brad Wall. Welcome back to the Wilson Center. I know you were here a couple years ago on another energy program. Um, so since uh, we're limited on time, I'm going to limit the introduction. You have his uh, biography just here, real but quick. Real, quick, real, quick, real, quick. real quick, Premier of Saskatchewan elected in, in 20 2007. But what's really amazing is his 2011 election with 64% of the popular vote. That's pretty amazing. All right, okay. over to yeah. you. Uh, well, uh, I guess this is a chance to have a little bit of a dialogue. I think I'm going to be speaking at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a luncheon a little bit later on. But uh, Professor, my old political studies professor, John Courtney, sitting right over there. Now, I'm really nervous. <laughs> you don't have your red pen, sir, do you? No. no. Oh, well, that's excellent. Also, I note uh, one of our members of the Legislative Assembly, Herb Cox, is, uh, is here as well. He's the member for North Battleford, a historic community uh, in our province. So. We've been here now for about a day and a half, and uh, we won't go home until uh, uh, tomorrow. Another chance to give a speech a little bit uh, tomorrow, as well as a few last meetings. It's been a very uh, robust, it's been a very busy program we've had. We're trying to pack in as much as we can. Uh, and uh, we're here talking about Keystone, not just Keystone. We have trade issues as a province around agriculture, something called country of origin labeling that many in the room will know all about. Uh, and um, uh, other energy issues, but principally we've been here to, to talk a little bit about Keystone. And uh, again, I, I'm going to have a I'm going to talk in in a little while, a little bit in more detail about that. So I won't get into all of it, except to say this: we actually don't have any economic oil sands production in the province. We have the potential for it. We have about 10,000 square miles of uh, the right geology for oil sands. We have Synovus now, who has taken over a lease of that particular uh, oil sands property, and. Uh, they obviously have a lot of experience in the industry just over the border um, where the food that fed the dinosaurs also died and was, uh, was is now, of course, the, the resource we're talking about, is where Sinovus operates their oil sands operation on a SAGD basis in situ principally. And so uh, we're hopeful one day we might be in the oil sands business, but we're not now. So maybe we're a bit of an honest broker uh, with respect to the pipeline that we're talking about, although we have a vested interest. The discount, because uh, our oil is heavier, not as heavy as bitumen, but heavier, the discount costs the owner of our resource, which is the people of the province, about 19 percent for our particular budget this year that we'll, we'll table on the 20th of March, a balanced budget we'll table, but it'll be $300 million short on oil royalties based on what it could be were the differential uh, not there, the discount. There's other issues here as well. The capacity issue around the Bakken formation in terms of pipeline uh, is, very, is a very difficult thing. Uh, and for those in this in this community, in this city here, and in the in the United States, and, and people on our side of the border, for those who believe that uh, that you can stop a pipeline and that's going to be good for the environment because the oil will stop moving, ought to come and see the rail cars that are hauling oil out of the Bakken formation, because there is a capacity issue there, and we see uh, the rail car or the railing as the answer. And by the way, those things, there's accidents on the rail as well, unfortunately. So from a capacity uh, standpoint, we have a lot of interest in it because we share the Bakken formation uh, as well. And um, just the general trade relationship, I think, is going to be impacted by, an, uh, by the decision when it's finally made. Uh, the announcement last Friday by the State Department is a hopeful thing, I think. Ca I think there's cautious optimism, but the final decision remains to be made. And uh, uh, I think the relationship itself, um, based on my discussions with federal officials, the Prime Minister and the Minister, are, is uh, it will be informed by... Uh, by what happens here, so uh, um, uh, we're just happy to be here. We've had a very warm reception. We've met with uh, leaders on both uh, decision makers on both sides of the aisle, and later this day with the state with the State Department, and a chance also to get our message out through venues like this, and, and maybe uh, have a chance for a Q and A. Do we want to do that? Sure. I think we want to do that. That's all I got to say <laughs> for now. Any questions? Oh well, you don't have to. No. <laughs> It'll be a little bit more formal later on. Anything? Any questions? It's a good chance for a dialogue. Yes, sir. <coughs> Premier Wall, thanks very much for coming to Washington. Robert Johnson from your Asia Group. Um, one of the panels earlier before you came in was talking about um, there's some questions about value added uh, and the, this, the sort of debate over exporting oil versus refining and upgrading. Yeah. Of course, the history of Saskatchewan and Alberta uh, government supporting upgrading in the past. Right. Um, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how that may evolve? Sure. I'll d I just met with the Premier Redford before coming down here. We wanted to kind of compare notes about what we were saying in this uh, on the particular issue. 
We both agree. The industry agrees. I mean, the market actually has to weigh in and, think, and, and sanction it, but we agree that uh, upgrading uh, and refining more of the product at home is important. And you're right. The last time two provinces and a federal government and an oil company got together uh, and did anything in this respect, it happened at Lloydminster, Saskatchewan. And for those of you who, who may not know about that city, <laughs> Uh, if I was from Alberta, I'd say Lloydminster, Alberta, because it is right on the border, uh, literally on the border. It runs right through the community. But it, it's also located up the west side of our province and the east side of Alberta, of course, and so it's right in the middle of a, a lot of heavy oil, and it was a, a perfect place for an upgrader. Um, the, uh, that particular project saw the provincial governments of both provinces put actual money in, and uh, I'm not sure that'll ever happen again. It won't from our standpoint. We will not use taxpayers as involuntary venture capitalists on any project. Governments, uh, when they pick winners and losers, are generally half right. <coughs> but uh, what it demonstrated was, and by the way, the federal government put money in, of course, Husky. It demonstrated that the, uh, and it, it's very successful today. There's also ethanol happening there, and it demonstrated that uh, this is possible. So can two provinces work together maybe on the tax side of things to make things a bit more competitive? on a new growth basis for upgrading or refining and with help from the federal government. Not, not equity, not cash or grants, but on a tax, from a tax standpoint, I think we can. And so uh, Premier Redford and I have uh, agreed that our, a couple of ministers on each side are going to get together and have an informal working group and explore, canvas what options there might be, obviously respecting the fact that the market, you know, refining happens close to the market because it needs to be close to the market, but upgrading is, is something else. And we want to add more value in Canada for sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Joe Dukert, I'm an independent energy analyst. Uh, since you mentioned two or more provinces can work together, you've spoken recently with uh, Allison Redford. Uh, what do you think school. might come out of uh, the agreement to come up with a national energy strategy among the uh, among the provinces promised, I think, for July? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's going to be, um, I think it'll be a lot of bilateral work within the context of a national agreement. And what I mean by that, you know, we had uh, uh, Allison Redford, Premier Redford hosted recently the New Brunswick Premier, David Allward, uh, uh, in, in Alberta. And we've chatted uh, since then as well, Premier Allward and I, about the, uh, the possibility, and by the way, companies are actively on this, uh, of reversing pipelines. Uh, so that they're flowing to Atlantic Canada um, because, of course, that's easier than building a new one. And uh, there's deep water port there, of course, in New Brunswick. So there's, that would be an example of something of, of sort of a bilateral approach, although Quebec would be involved, the provinces in the middle would be involved. But principally, those are the, the end and the beginning provinces are involved. That's part of a national energy strategy. You know, it, it is, in our view. It, we, our federation is quite decentralized, and the resources, as Professor Cor Courtney taught me early on, are obviously the purview of the uh, provincial governments, and we're, we're happy for that. Uh, but it actually it doesn't, it means that cooperating on things like pipelines and energy transmission is a bit more complicated. Still, though, I think what the premiers have agreed to is, look, we, we're all doing our things in terms of environment and the energy. We all understand the importance of transmission so we can work together uh, within the, under the context of a general agreement in, ca in Canada by its first ministers that being an energy power is a good thing. By the way, that's not the considered view of all of the interest, political interests in our country, and it should be because it is a good thing. Being an energy power means you've got an economic base to improve quality of life and invest in the environment and all those good things, but the premiers have agreed that it is. And so within that overall context, we basically agreed to explore whatever interprovincial cooperation, however many provinces that you know, each individual project may involve, to explore them uh, to, uh, to, to ensure that we have the efficacious transportation of energy in Canada. And it's, that, it's going to be that loose. Uh, I think you'll see the strategy that's that, sort of that loose because of the nature of the Federation. Premier, always good to see you. Tom Huffaker with Exxon Mobil. Good to see you, Tom. You answered a, a little bit of this question, maybe, but we, you obviously are talking a lot about KXL, and, and we all are very focused on KXL. Also be interested in your take on the politics around and the environmental issues around trying to get east. You just talked about that a little bit, and trying to get west yeah. in Canada. Sure. Well, you can, you know, I, I'm not very hopeful about Gateway happening uh, and uh, I do I am hopeful though that there will be the opportunity to move the product to the west coast and access Asia um, there are different options being looked at from well from <coughs> rail frankly but also uh, to you know I think one day there might be a different proposal perhaps um, 
and uh, I'm I'm hopeful. Uh, um, I, I'm still I should say I'm cautiously optimistic. Last week, and I won't get into the details. Last week we met with a lot in industry, and I told them actually I didn't. I think this thing was that that particular project was dead in the water, and I kind of still am of that view. But the the idea, the concept isn't. So in the meantime, this movement to the east coast is increasingly important because of the discount. I mean, we have a huge differential right now, not just between West Texas and Brent, but between West Texas and the heavier prices or the bitumen prices. And so we have many, many differentials. And, and, uh, and again, I work for the people of Saskatchewan. It's their oil and it's non-renewable and they are not maximizing their return. And so our job should be focused on that. And I, I, I can't be more specific on the West Coast piece, except I think if it's going to, if it's going to work, it might, need, it might be another iteration. Mr. Manning. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Premier. David Manning from Alberta. Um, just, uh, Tom just touched on the environmental issues, and you're very familiar, I'm sure, with them. Could you talk a little bit? I, I recognize that a lot of the environmental regulation is an Alberta issue. But could you tell us a bit about your experience with carbon capture sequestration and your perception mm -hmm. of industry standard and the business case for energy efficiency and <coughs> emissions within the oil sands producers and the producers who produce within Saskatchewan? I couldn't comment so much on the oil sands piece, but certainly uh, we are working with the federal government on the regulations that they are bringing forward. Minister Oliver was referencing them in Chicago yesterday. I think it is helpful in terms of timing that we are uh, talking about it. Uh, I think uh, I got asked by CBC yesterday, well, but we, you know, the regulations aren't there, so how can you make the case in the United States that, look, we're serious about it and it's happening and, and maybe that gives you some elbow room on uh, proving Keystone? Well, I think the best indicator of future action is past action, is my answer, and past action is that we have the regs on coal that are more aggressive than the regs on coal here, not by not a, a little bit. And, uh, and uh, they are in place by 215. And we rely on coal. In, in our province, our profile is very similar to the profile of the U.S. We have about a 40 percent reliance on coal. It fluctuates, but that's what it is. And here it's 36 to 40 percent, I understand. So, you know, I, I, I just think that in a general sense, we, we're, we need to be able to indicate, and again, I'll talk about it later, but we need to indicate we're serious about the environment because we are, and give the administration the elbow room they need with that remaining flank of opposition to say, well, you know, Here's the record. Here's what they're trying to do, and it's meaningful and it's not inexpensive. We're doing carbon capture and sequestration in our province. We have been for a long time. A previous administration uh, worked together and got support from the USDOE uh, to uh, to, uh, s to to bring CO2 from Beulah, North Dakota, at a coal gasification plant into Weyburn, Saskatchewan, where today uh, in that area, 40 percent of the world's successfully stored CO2 is stored right there. The International Energy Agency monitors it and storage works. That's why the UN, I think, has said this is one of the arrows in the quiver. It's one of the answers. And so uh, what happens prior to the storage, of course, is enhanced oil recovery uh, because, uh, you know, there, there's, not, there's fewer solvents as, as good as CO2 in terms of those tight plays. And rather than punch more holes in the earth, we're seeing a reanimation of previously thought to be, you know, finished leases producing again. And then when that CO2 is used as a solvent, it's extracted again, and that's when it's stored and stored successfully. And by the way, a lot of the things that around carbon capture work, the EOR part makes it, makes it attractive, but if you look, there's, there's, coal, there's, there's synergies with coal that make, there, there's an application for it beyond it being uh, um, sort of coincidentally located near an, an oil field. Sir, right there. I'm Bob Scarpel from North Dakota, hmm. and there was uh, some discussion prior to your arriving about the potential for value added and doing refining, you know, in Alberta, potentially Saskatchewan, and, and we've discussed it in North Dakota. But from your perspective and your analysis, would it result in any less need for pipeline because the refined product has to move somewhere? I mean, would it re would it result in any less need? I don't think so. Uh, it's just a question of uh, does it make it, uh, first of all, from an economic development standpoint, it's better for us. If it makes economic sense to do this further away from the markets, if it makes sense to do it, then we should be supporting it. Right now, I think about over $2 billion worth of our oil goes to Montana, mostly to Billings, where the, those were the refining, those were the upgrading jobs are there. So that's a, it underscores the benefit of this relationship. 
as long as the economics make sense. I don't think we, we ought to be very wary of contrivances when it comes to these large scale industrial projects because, as I said, when governments pick winners and losers, they only get them really half right. But if it makes economic sense, then I don't think there's the issue on transportation is there. I, I tend to think that whether you're moving a, um, a, a refined product, an upgraded product, or a raw product, um, you're going to need to move it. And right now, you know, in North Dakota, you, it's hard getting anything else on a rail uh, because of the uh, because of what's happening there. We had a chance to meet with uh, Senator Heidkamp this morning, and uh, rail's getting busier and busier in that state, in Montana, in our province. There's a new rail line being built for the first time, maybe since Sir John A. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the uh, and the pipeline's going south, and it's about agriculture, agricultural products, and it's about oil. So. Uh, Premier, uh, I'm Fazil Siddiq from Dalhousie University and uh, mm -hmm. Fulbright Research Chair here at the Wilson Center. Yes. Um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, especially in the last uh, year or two, uh, about uh, the future of uh, the energy situation in North America, more specifically once the United States achieves uh, self-sufficiency, uh, our surplus energy uh, might have to be exported elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what your thoughts were uh, in the medium term and in the long term for the potential of energy exports uh, to other countries, most notably um, Asia and the growing economies of China and India and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, are there planning works uh, in, and do you discuss these with your uh, Western premiers, mm -hmm. uh, Premier Redford and others, uh, about uh, what uh, the next generation might expect uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, uh, wearing your stewardship hat, if you will, Premier, if you can tell us uh, uh, what we might expect for our children as well the energy needs um, of the East continues to grow and we have the surplus, whether or not there is a connection that we might be able to take advantage of. Sure, thanks. This is a big part of that energy strategy discussion, is this uh, access to those particular markets, and it also deals with the pipeline question, uh, our own pipeline question in Canada. Uh, and I am, uh, in, in, to Tom's question, and I am... You know, I really am hopeful that we can find a way to make it work politically and uh, environmentally and economically uh, to the West Coast because I think we just have to. I think the, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the uh, I've seen the same data and the same forecast that you're referencing. I think it's now become sort of just part of the, part of the dialogue and taken as given, although I note that uh, I, think, uh, th I think just yesterday the state of New York has said no to, uh, to fracking. Uh, and so I, I think that... Uh, there might be some attendant environmental issues here to be dealt with yet with respect to that because I think a lot of that analysis on self-sufficiency is dependent on how do we work in those tight plays and fracking obviously is is the t is a preferred technology so but still uh, let's assume it happens we ought to we ought to be ready for for that to, for the need to diversify and that's why these the, the, the one option is west the other option is though it's further away from that market you're talking about but still closer to the Brent price is going to the uh, to Atlantic Canada if we're importing oil from other places in central Canada or uh, that doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense because again we haven't dealt with this transmission issue so I, I just think um, we don't have a choice I think we have we, we are now and are uh, and will continue to be an energy power not just because of oil, but because of uranium. 17% of the world's uh, uranium is comes from our province. Uh, we have all we have the renewables. We have the technology. You know, we should we should make sure we can get the energy to there from here. And uh, I think that'll be a top priority for governments. But it's not an easy proposition in a de in a decentralized federation. Uh, Premier Paul Caring with the Globe and Mail. Um, I asked, uh, I in fairness, you weren't here, I asked one of the previous panelists uh, who was expert in energy and environmental litigation whether it would be hard to tie up uh, a Keystone decision for many years with litigation. He, he said he wouldn't address Keystone in particular, but he said in general a big complex, uh, a big complex project that covered a whole bunch of jurisdictions was it was not difficult to create delay. Um, I guess my question to you is, are you comfortable that the decision later this year, if it comes later this year, will be the end of the Keystone question mark? Or is this just the end of another chapter? I think we're a lot closer to the end if we get the right decision, uh, you know, obviously. But, you know, the parts of the uh, Keystone that are under construction, and that's not a small part of it, <coughs> approved, of course, and announced in a federal, in, you know, during the campaign, 
that those are happening and I understand they're happening quite smoothly so that might be the best uh, indicator of what's uh, of what might happen we also know we sent a letter to the administration signed by 10 governors uh, uh, and uh, and endorsed also by by the new governor of Montana and uh, that's a, th that's along the route not to say that there's not interest groups along the route that might have a problem and might want to use whatever legal leverage they thought existed to slow it down but again I'd point to what's happening already on the southern piece of it and also the 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 high degree of support that exists for the pipeline I think the the last poll numbers have it at around 70 percent those numbers get a lot higher along the route so um, you know and I think that does matter actually I get that there's the chance for uh, groups to be litigious about it if they can to use that leverage but I think it's a diminished opportunity given the intensity of the support that exists along the route where that legal action would need to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Right down here. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda Kenny from the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association. And I, I guess I, ha I have a bit of a political question for you, but it's m it's not. Uh, it's not in terms of polling, it's more just your experiences. And uh, you uh, hosted uh, the Penwar conference in Saskatchewan last July. Mm -hmm. um, you've referenced your dealings with um, Premier Radford. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Halifax uh, a couple weeks ago and really interested in the, um, in the loosening of a province by province view on energy in the wake of Muskrat Falls and interconnects between mm -hmm. Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Earlier this morning, we also heard some tension even within the state of New York where um, the upper state might prefer uh, some fracking and development and, and the decision you referenced is, uh, is going in a different direction. So the question is this, um, in your experience and observation going forward, um, how is the energy and infrastructure issue affecting uh, regional and international politics? And what I mean by that is how alliances are being formed um, how partnerships are changing and the dynamics of, say, in your role as Premier of a province working with your uh, brothers and sisters across Canada or into the U.S. Is this issue creating a, a new spirit um, of looking at things uh, a little bit differently in terms of political interests or not? Wow. <laughs> No, I wouldn't say not yet, but hope springs eternal. Not what's needed anyway. Right over here. Hi. Um my friend and I are actually here, students from Saskatchewan, so we're, we welcome you. And so um, we sort of had a discussion about how there's a lot of organizations who are really opposed to the pipeline, and some might say it's just miscommunication, um, and they, their opposition is quite fierce. So I was wondering, um, what do you think environmental groups could do to um, initiate more productive discussions with the government on environmental issues? Hmm. Well, you know, I, the environmental groups that we deal with, I think, do that now. I think they're engaged in, uh, in, in constructive ways. Uh, they are, they want to hold us accountable provincially for our environmental record and initiatives, and that's the way it should be. Uh, and, um, but in terms, uh, in the context of the Keystone issue, I do think, you know, we haven't really made the environmental case. And I understand that in the election, <coughs> the, the ballot question was about the economy, and so we made an economic case, and that's reasonable. And we made the North American energy security case, and that's reasonable, I think compelling. Um, and we see now support on the economic side now on, on both sides of the spectrum. We see trade unions, and we see other, you know, the, the more business mind, uh, the business end of things. Uh, but as I said, I think what, what, the, what, what the administration needs is some elbow room around the environment. And uh, I think the interest groups here know, although I know most of them, uh, the ones that I'm thinking of right now, will never ever accept, uh, will never support Keystone and are just not interested in the end of any sentences when, you know, in that regard. There might be a great a number of people in the middle, including decision makers who are sort of on the fence and might like to know that arguably the first jurisdiction in, in North America that had a price on carbon was Alberta. 
that we have a greenhouse gas legislation in our province and we'll set up an attendant fund to that that is fueled by fees levies of uh, of those who are heavy emitters and we'll invest that back in technology they might want to know about our clean coal initiative at 1.24 billion dollars and uh, that that again holds great promise they might want to know that our coal regulations are more aggressive than the u.s that we do have uh, in each of the provinces uh, aggressive moves towards renewable energy will double our wind and uh, uh, double our wind by 217 in the province and get up to a number that's very comparable to the sort of top tier provinces in Canada and uh, I don't think we've told that story very well you know again it might not change a lot of minds but I, if it provides a little bit of elbow room to make the decision to say look this country cares about these issues this country cares about the CO2 footprint of, of bitumen and look what the companies in Alberta and the feds are doing um, we need to do a better job of that, and that's part of what our message has been here. We haven't come down here with the economic message, and we'll leave without one while it's here already. We're not going to stop uh, focusing on the environment. Uh, that's what I think we need to do. Well, thank you very much, Premier. Um, what a great end to a really good morning. Um, please help me uh, thank him. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And I understand you're on a tight schedule with uh, your other folks. So thank right. you very much. Good. Thanks very much.